Well, thanks very much for that, uh, that lovely introduction, and thank you very much to the Rachel Carson Centre for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to be here for these three months. Um, my talk today draw, draws on my research project, Heat, Light and Work in Canadian Homes, A Social History of Energy, 1850 to 1950. My research focuses on the history of daily life in that period to understand how people experienced and made sense of at the level of the household. The transition from the organic energy regime of wood, wind, water, muscle power, and muscle power to the industrial or mineral energy regime of coal, oil, and natural gas a transition that is comprised industrialization or the shift to modernity. The household scale of analysis not only documents what it was like to experience that transition, information that indeed might be useful in itself now at a time when people around the world are contemplating the next energy transition away from fossil fuels and what that might uh, look like, but provides as well key insights into the context, so the household pro provides as well key insights into the context causes and consequences of national and even global energy transitions that I would argue can be difficult to see um, when the scale of analysis is, is larger. For more recent res research is confirming that notwithstanding the big picture of the transition from the organic to the mineral energy regime so far, energy transitions have been highly variable, intermittent, overlapping, and in some cases strongly resisted. My work is part of a, a larger and, I think, surprisingly recent convergence among social, environmental and energy historians to create a socio-ecological approach um, to energy transitions and one that emphasizes the historical contingency of the transitions in the attempt, uh, in Stefania Barca's words, to put, uh, to put labor, human bodies and landscapes into the story of energy transitions. And my work attempts to add households to, to those discussions. The household not only comprises a space that illuminates human agency, but it allows historians to explore the way that various aspects of the political economy, including hierarchies of gender, place, ethnicity, occupation and class, are worked out through energy practices. Practices that are fundamentally, I would argue, about people's relationship directly and indirectly to the environment. As a social history of energy in the household, therefore, my research is also an environmental history of the home, tracing the ways that Canadians shifted from relying on organic, locally available and vernacular forms of energy to centralized, commodified, and network-provided systems with all the environmental as well as political and economic consequences that that's involved. So how did Canadians experience the first um, energy transition? And here I'm drawing on work that Richard Unger uh, did with, with John Thistle to, com uh, to create the first statistical uh, breakdown of, ca of Canadians' en energy use which has been vital, actually, in my work. While Canada has followed international trends in rapidly increasing energy consumption with industrialization, Canadians have long been among the highest uh, per capita consumers of energy. At the moment, uh, this year, now on par with Americans, they have usually consumed more than twice as much energy as Europeans, sometimes as much as six times as much uh, from the early 19th century and earlier, and in including the present day. Very high energy consumption is generally explained by the country's long, cold winters, its size and its low population density. And I just want to point out, here's England here just about the size of our Lake Superior there. So yeah, it's big, it's big. Um, the uh, huge, huge distances uh, separated people. Um, uh, sorry, I'll put that back. Uh, separated um, people, commodities, and markets. The country also has a superabundance of organic uh, mineral and mineral resources, particularly in high energy resource extraction industry, which Richard is gonna um, talk about later. Recent international statistics, uh, again, compiled by uh, uh, Richard Unger and John Thistle, have confirmed another distinction. While Canada industrialized rapidly from the 19th century and considered, uh, considers itself an, an early industrializing country, the transition from the organic to the mineral energy regime was much, much slower in Canada and later in Canada than in other industrializing countries. And this green, that's what it's telling you. Um, the superabundant av availability of biomass fuel, that's wood, and water to transport. It provides a partial explanation of why it was not till 1906 that Canadians obtained more energy from fossil fuels than from trees. 
a benchmark that England and Wales had reached by 1800, so more than 100 years earlier, and the United States by the 1880s. It was not until 1955 that Canada reached the 90% level of modern versus traditional energy that Britain had attained more than a century earlier by 1845. These trends are, are clearly articulated in patterns of everyday life. As late as 1941, almost half of all Canadian homes were still cooking and heating their homes with wood, and more than 80% in Canada's still dominant rural areas. It wasn't until the 1950s um, that, that most rural homes were connected to the electrical grid, which is what I'll be talking about in a minute. Much of my research has focused on answering one question. What can the household level of analysis tell us about why Canadians took so long to make the transition to fossil fuels? The rest of this paper looks at just one example. I have lots from my work, but just one. Uh, central station electricity to argue that Canada's slow and late adoption of modern energy can be explained in part by the good fit in the 1850 to 1950 period between, on the one hand, the energy needs of Canadian households and their well-functioning vernacular energy harvesting practices. Um, and on the other hand, by the relatively poor fit between household needs and the newly emerging grid system of, of electricity gen uh, delivery on, on the other. So Canadian households were working really well at uh, getting their own energy for not in, from their local environments. In large part because of the abundance of water and the absence of coal at the geographical center of Canadian urbanization and, and, and industrialization, Ontario, uh, which along with Quebec are the, where most of the people in Canada live, Ontario made the decision in 1906 to create a vast hydroelectric network to supply electricity, creating the first publicly owned system in, in North America and perhaps in the English-speaking world. Quebec and later Manitoba and British Columbia followed. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, water powered over 90% of electrical energy, and in some years it was 98%. Uh, consumed in the country, and Canada remains one of the world's uh, major producers of hydroelectricity today, third, the third largest. The costs uh, were enormous of setting, uh, setting up that, that system of hydroelectricity, as was the scale of development. As in Canada, we don't call it electricity, we actually call it hydro. Um, so electric streetcars, commuter trains, and street lighting were the first huge electricity com consumers that launched municipal electrical industries in the 19th century, and 20th century expansion was largely based on the electricity-hungry um, international industries drawn to Canada by the promise of, of cheap electricity, which, which we will again talk about more. But the electrical grid came with its own exacting conditions, because electricity is not only able to be transported uh, cheaply, um, but it must be transported constantly. As his historian Harold Platt put it, unlike any previous method of supplying light and power, generating electricity involved a highly interdependent and integrated system. Every one of its several, several complex components had to be in perfect balance with all the others to maintain an electrical current. Industries did their part to ensure instant harmony, consuming most of the electricity and providing most of the revenues. Um, notwithstanding the tiny amounts that individual households consume, by comparison, however, the residential market also played a key role in harmonizing the network system. Electrical companies did not need to make further substantial capital investments, like more dams or more transmission lines, to provide electrical lighting for home use. Home service provided an important elastic market where returns could be increased simply by persuading more customers to purchase more electricity. Furthermore, home electrical consumption, with its at first tiny but cumulative amounts for cooking, heating, and lighting in the home, was particularly useful in balancing the load in off-peak hours when industry did not require as much power. Hydroelectric networks, in other words, look to residential customers to provide the profit icing on their economic cake. So that was the hope. That was their interest in, um, in, in electrifying households. Canadian households responded quickly. Hundreds of companies were in business, uh, electrical companies were in business by the 1880s, and basic household electrical service grew substantially between 1921 and 1951, from just over half a million households to almost 3.5 million. As a cross-linking of published census data about households and the central electric stations, domestic customers indicates the percentage of households in, with electricity grew steadily from just under 50% in 1921, which is a lot for that date, to almost 90% in the 1950s. 
but there were problems. Uh, average figures cloak the great regional disparities, and here's the different provinces in, in, in Canada, and the great regional disparity uh, related, and there, so there was a lot of difference um, in the amount and the extent of, of electrification. Um, until the 1940s, the majority of, of Canadians um, still were living outside of concentrated urban areas that made residential um, electrification unprofitable. So the, the main differences that we see between provinces are in fact, or mapped very closely onto differences of the percentage of rural and urban um, populations. <clears throat> These two HGIS maps, uh, one showing uh, farm and one showing non-farm uh, electrification, indicate the huge difference between farms and non-farm households. Like the much smaller gaslight industry, central station electricity generation was poorly adapted to the low density geographical distribution of Canada's predominantly rural population until after the mid-20th century. And I'd be happy to answer more about this sort of unusual fact about Canadian history, that it was a predominantly rural country until the 1940s. But even where electricity was generally available in urban Canada, the industry suffered from a very limited consumer demand in the early years in, how, in the houses that did decide to, quote, sign on for the juice, um, as they called it. By 1921, a majority of homes in towns and cities did have electrical service as, a, as compared to 6% in Britain at the time. So uh, Canadians, yeah, more than 90%. But, uh, but until the 1950s, consumers largely failed to step up their consumption from the relatively tiny amounts that are used for lighting to more energy consuming appliances and machines. Within the houses that had central uh, station electricity, average monthly consumption of electricity varied considerably across the country, but consistently before 1951. This is showing three different years for each of the provinces. So here is the average amount of electricity that was consumed. And I did a little graph showing that um, this is the amount of electricity that you need for basic lighting. This is for lighting and refrigeration. And this is for lighting, refrigeration, and a stove. And you can see most households simply did not uh, consume enough electricity. Um, electrical service uh, was basically limited to having four light bulbs, probably on, only on the main floor of the house. And that was the extent of their electrical revolution. Um, this was not just a local or even a national problem. As recent research has emphasized, the normalized rules of supply and demand so often applied to the growth of consumer society in these years, like the early 20th century, had in fact little bearing on the growth of the new energy regime, particularly hydroelectricity, that was offering new ways of working within the home. While electrical companies needed more households to boost production and therefore lower cost per kilowatt hour, which was always their goal, supply in fact had lagged far behind um, demand. By uh, the turn of the 20th century, in response to this failure of households to step up their, their um, consumption of electricity, uh, a loose network of power companies, consulting firms, public agencies, and electrical device manufacturers had to invent the electrical power consumers that their institutions and systems seem to require. In the electric business, as in the manufactured gas, vigorous salesmanship was needed to realize the profits that residential use had promised. Homemakers from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century and beyond became the first objects of widespread interest, the targets for the first time. No one had really been interested in what women did in the, in the home before that. The, the targets of an unprecedented, sustained, and multifaceted educational campaign directed at changing their energy-related uh, practices in the home. Home economics, home economics classes, public cooking demonstrations, radio broadcasts, traveling displays, and aggressive advertising all sought to convince women of the improvements that these new energy re regime would bring into their lives. Um, certainly part of the problem lay in the notoriously um, poor uh, service of the electrical systems. The households that um, the households uh, that went into the, to the considerable trouble and expense of, a, of installing new lighting complained constantly about its quality. Hydroelectric pa uh, electric power could be intermittent or fail completely due to uh, frequent equipment failure brought about by storms, droughts, ice, and scheduled maintenance. Fluctuating and erratic voltage caused other problems. Black, uh, brownouts were common. As one Vancouver Island customer explained, the electric cooking stove is not supplied with the requisite amount of juice for satisfactory cooking. The lights go down in my house, 
Hmm, that's an interesting coincidence. Are they listening? The lights go down in my house if I turn on my cook stove. And also, and also my neighbors state that their lights go down when I turn on my cook stove as well. This is just one of hundreds of examples of, of the, the poor the poor service. Sorry, no, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the, <laughs> the electrical grid system simply did not work very well in, in the early decades. If lighting was poor, then the perceived price uh, was high, curbing uh, demand for electricity in the home. One of the most difficult aspects of the new energy regime for consumers was tr just simply trying to understand its complex and mysterious nature. Um, the problem of incomprehensibility manifested itself most urgently in the pricing schemes for electricity. For most consumers, the system for, of charging for electricity remained, and I have to say for many of us still remains, as obscure as the processes of generation and transmission. Many simply could not figure out what they were being charged for and harbored deep suspicions about the new network system. For men and women used to managing and controlling many of their own energy needs within the households by burning more wood, or filling more kerosene lamps. This was a particular frustration. For most Canadian households before 1940 already had well-established energy practices that were affordable, comprehensible, and controllable. This points up was, which, what was perhaps the most uh, significant factor limiting uh, demand, the poor fit between the well-established and cost-effective patterns by which Canadian households met their daily energy needs and the ability of the grid to make them, meet them. The situation was particularly acute for the majority of the population living in rural areas whose distinctive political economy included direct access uh, to, to energy. Um, uh, households had already, cost of, already had cost-effective ways of meeting their energy needs and ones that worked well uh, in ways that households could uh, both uh, uh, understand and afford. Local sources of energy including food, wind and fuel would continue to be harvested and to support daily life um, in, into the post-war period. And electricity, which was most cost-effectively consumed when used consistently over a day, month, and year, worked poorly in accommodating the highly variable seasonal and weather-related rhythms of, of rural life. While hydro companies blamed farmers for clinging to old methods of work that were not suited to the modern world, that is, the needs of the electrical grid, farmers remained skeptical and gener generally resistant. In conclusion, Canadian history provides abundant evidence that people made their decisions about whether to adopt new energy systems and to what extent based on a host of factors including cost, integrating into, integration into existing patterns of energy use and available alternatives. If, as now seems possible, the late 19th and 20th centuries will appear in the historical record as the first and the last age of abundant energy, the focus on the household allows us to see changes in the relationship between people and their environment that defined it, the shifting contours of the transition from the organic to the mineral energy regime. In the process, we can see the key role that households play in energy transitions, not just as recipients or consumers of change, but as producers, shapers, and agents. In a field rich with eco-apocalyptic pessimism, a focus on the household may hold um, some uh, solutions for negotiating the changes that lie ahead in our transition to a low-carbon future. Thank you.